Great. Well, thanks so much for having me. I think this colloquium is a great idea. It's great to have NC State interacting with other universities in the area. And uh, just to tell you a little bit about me, I grew up in Montana and am a first generation college student and uh, liked it enough to continue all the way and get my PhD. And my general approach has been since I was first conducting research as a sophomore undergrad is to make observations and ask questions about them and then really pursue the questions I'm excited about and think about the drama of being a part of the scientific record and community that's really over space and time. It's exciting to me. And so I try to have conservation implications for the work that I do. I have since I first started doing research. And I try to ask questions about things that excite me. And I love the idea that I can conduct experiments and answer those questions myself. So uh, I'm happy to answer more specific questions at the end of the talk. But I'm going to give you guys a story here about one of the things I'm really excited about right now, which is the title of this talk, City Ants and Junk Food. How does our diet influence the species that share our cities? And I'm focusing on ants because they're one group that interacts with us the most. But uh, just be aware that there are a lot of different animals that share our cities. Uh, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. So the first kind of starting point we had was thinking about how ecology is studied. And so the picture on the left here is of a forest that is protected. And that's where more than 70% of all ecology studies have been conducted so far. And we know actually quite a bit about the factors that promote diversity and maintain it. What might change how diversity is uh, the di dynamics of diversity over time and the effects of major disturbances on that diversity and the ecosystem services and processes, the diverse plant and animal communities uh, <coughs> really drive. So that's, that's the good news. We have this great body of theory that can make predictions. The startling news is that less than 4% of all study in ecology has been done in cities. And this is a relatively small land area covered, but more than half of all people in the world live in cities. So it is one of the only habitats in the world that is growing. So we came to this with the question, are predictions from these studies of protected areas really appropriate for urban ecosystems? And really what we're asking is, when do cities break the rules? And as I said, you may ask, well, if they only cover a small part of the planet, why do we even care about what's happening in cities? And I already told you the first point that I'd like to make, which is the world is becoming increasingly urban. This was an infographic put together by the UN. So they looked from 1900 projected all the way out to 2050. And they looked at how many humans in the world live in cities versus rural areas. And as you can see, we're becoming more and more an urban uh, society as a whole human population. And in around 2008 to 2010, we crossed that 50% threshold. So now more than half of all people in the world live in cities. So not only are more people concentrated in cities, but the area of cities is growing. It is one of the only habitats in the world that is expanding under human-driven change, which may not be surprising. What is surprising is we don't know what's happening in these cities because there's this idea that you have to hike for a mile before you get to ecology. Ecology is happening where you are. Another point is made by this pictogram from the Black Plague. If you can't read that, it says, carts full of dead to bury. This is a story of ecology in cities that wasn't understood. So the species that were driving the virus and, or sorry, the bacteria and driving this disease dynamic were in cities and there was an enormous human cost as a result of not understanding that. 
So they're the species most likely to affect us and most likely to be affected by us. So I'm going to be talking about this dynamic, which is that we feed lots of animals in cities. Uh, but there are a lot of different ways we affect them, and we're even starting to see that humans may be affecting the evolution of species that share our cities. So they're most likely to be affected by us and affect us. OK, so if you're going to study a city, why not go to Manhattan? <laughs> That's what I did. So this is an artist's depiction here of a modern day Manhattan juxtaposed against what it might have looked before any development happened. And the first thing you might notice looking at this or might observe is, wow, that's a lot of change. We've really transformed this habitat. And from this kind of depiction and kind of what we think of generally when we think of cities, we think of them as really not having any green spaces left. But if we zoom in, there's actually remnant forest. So there are species that have been in Manhattan and are still hanging in there, even with all this development. And there are lots of ants. Ants interact with people. They have lots of ecosystem effects. And they're found throughout the built and unbuilt environment in the city. And so I was really interested in understanding the diversity and ecology of these ants that are sharing our cities, because they can have such strong effects. And we can affect them in multiple ways. I'm going to be focusing on this middle one, but we can also change their chronic stress regimes, which basically means we can make the environment more harsh for them. We can also create this matrix that they can't get through, so they're more isolated. And that's a thing that might be really strongly influencing evolution. But today I'll talk about what we're doing in terms of feeding them and how that affects both us and them. So I'll have two questions. One is human-centered and the other is ant-centered. The first one is how much do ants actually contribute to food removal services in the city? And I'll make the case that food removal is a service in the city. And then the second is, how does that human food affect their ecology? So starting with humans, <coughs> these are a couple of pictures that I took in Manhattan. This is, both of these things are really common to see. There's lots of food carts. There's lots of people who drop food around the food carts. And uh, there's also lots of people who at least try to throw that food in the trash bin. There's a lot of overflowing trash. And in general, people pretty much intuitively understand that if trash is left on the street and doesn't get moved into trash bins, it can be problematic. Food waste can attract the growth of undesirable species like rats and mold that are associated with problems in human health, well-being, and general aesthetics. But even if that food makes it into the trash bin, it's still a problem for people. So once it's in the bin, we forget about it, but it goes to landfills. And in North America alone, we're generating more than half a kilogram per person per day of food waste in landfills. And each ton of that <coughs> is generating a lot of greenhouse gases. It's generating CO2 but it's also generating methane. And people don't realize this most of the time, but methane traps 21 times more heat than CO2 does. It's a major problem for global climate change. And with almost 8.5 million people, that means that New York City generates 140 to 150,000 meters cubed of methane each year. So this is a major problem that starts locally and really expands globally. So anything that urban animals, like ants, can do to remove food at the source before it gets moved to the landfills, so those ants crawling into the trash bins and taking out that food, that is an ecosystem service that helps people in cities and also helps people more globally if we think about climate change as a major problem. And I think most people do. So I told you that ants are really important in cities. And if anyone has questions about that, 
later. I'm happy to go on at length about that. But they're obviously not the only animals in cities. And I have a colleague at Fordham University, Jason Munchy South, who studies rodents in cities. And we already talked a little bit about the one that's found in the most urban habitats. And here, uh, in today's talk, the most urban environment I'll be talking about are the little strips of green vegetation called street medians that are right along Broadway Avenue. So two lanes going in either way, this, path, this strip of green vegetation in the middle. And in those strips, it's all rats. You don't really see any other mammals in those habitats. But he's gone into the forests of Manhattan. They exist. And uh, what he's found is these cute little mice that are native. And they were probably there even before humans started developing this landscape. <clears throat> Excuse me. So there's a good chance that these little white-footed mice and rats are doing very different things in these habitats. They're both interacting with ants and other insects. And so one thing we are interested in looking at is who's actually removing that food that we drop in the median. So we tested this using really human foods. We got potato chips, hot dogs, and cookies. And we put them out. And we either had them under a cage like that one or open. And so what the cage does is it allows us to compare how much the insects and their relatives, mostly ants, and that term is called arthropods, uh, how much of that food they're removing compared to vertebrates, things like in the medians where these trials were conducted, it, it's mostly going to be rats. OK, so here's what we found. And I'll just orient you to this graph. The x-axis here is the habitat type, either those street medians on Broadway or parks. And on the y-axis is the amount of food that was removed in 24 hours. The dark bars are inside the cage, and the white bars are outside of the cage. Showing you the potato chips as the starting point. And what you can see if you look at the parks first is that when we excluded vertebrates, about half of the food was removed. So that suggests that the vertebrates are contributing quite a bit to this food removal service in parks. If we go to medians, that effect goes away. More food is removed, and that food is removed by the insects. And we've got some data showing that the insects is mostly ants. A couple of isopods come in and carry off a piece of chip. But uh, so. This suggests that in the most urban environments, ants are actually really important for this service. And this is just a slide to remind you that ants are omnivores. If we go out into protected areas, they're going to be preying on other insects, like this katydid in this picture. And they're going to be eating sugar-rich foods. So they'll eat nectar. And they'll also tend aphids for this thing called honeydew, which is a nectar type substance. They're sap suckers. And they have lots of extra sugar water in their bodies. And ants will tap them with their antennae. They'll give them a little droplet of what's called honeydew. And then the ants will defend them against other insects. It's a really cool story. But what the end point is is that it's a huge carbohydrate resource for ants in the wild. Those resources change when they move into cities. There's still a few of these other insects around, but they're much less abundant in the most urban habitats. And so what happens? What are the consequences? We've been asking this for ourselves since I can remember. What happens when we have a more processed diet? Well, what happens when ants do? Is this health food for ants in cities? And so the first step to this was to do some food preference trials with ants. And uh, this has been done all over the world. The idea is you take all of the components of the ant's diet out into these liquid forms. So these are just tubes with cotton in them so that they can wick the food. And there's five stations, water, salt water, sugar water, amino acids, and that's just going to be the protein, and extra virgin olive oil for the fat. So we're taking these component parts out, 
and asking what they prefer. And the reason this has been done all over the world is that it tells us something about what those colonies need. So if a colony is tending lots and lots of those aphids and has a lot of carbohydrates, there's some evidence that they start preferring protein to balance out. And so, and that is really the story most places, protected areas. It becomes a story about sugars versus proteins. So remember I said in that very first slide, we want to know if predictions from protected areas can help us understand city ecology. And so here I have two, the top one is the city park predictions and the bottom one is the street medians. And it's pretty simple really. It's usually a story about proteins and sugars. And in habitats where there's lots of insects to eat, you might expect it to be biased towards sugars as a good resource for them. Whereas when they are starved for food because there's no crickets to eat, they might really go crazy for protein. And that's what we've seen if you look in lots of different habitats in the world, whether you're talking tropical or desert or temperate, you see that pattern. There's also some recent evidence that ants also need salt to grow their colonies. And there's lots of salts around city streets. And so we didn't think that would be a limiting nutrient in, uh, in street medians. And so those are the two things we kind of came in predicting. This is what we found. So sugars were, in fact, important. And if, again, we start with the city parks, we can see that, yep, most of the time they went for sugar, but they didn't go for the protein. The other most common food they went for was the olive oil, was the fat. And uh, that's an interesting finding in and of itself. But then we went to the street medians, and they went crazy for the fat. Almost 80% of all ants that came went for those fats with sugars being next. And uh, <clears throat> no, none of the ants were interested in proteins. And we use the exact same methodology and concentration of protein bait as people have used all over the world and found proteins to be important. And, and so that's, that's impressive. But you might say, you probably have different ants living in the medians and the parks. And some ants just like fat. So we looked at the species that was most common across parks and medians, the pavement ant. And here's what we found. 90, over 90% of pavement ants in parks went for sugars. And over 90% of pavement ants in medians went for fats. This is a really strong effect. This doesn't happen very often in ecology. This was really surprising. And so our initial hypothesis for why that might be happening is that, OK, where do they get fats in their health food diet? It's from insect bodies. And if insects are really reduced in medians, maybe that's making them fat starved more than it is making them protein starved because they can supplement protein more with human food. So we went out just this past September and hung out on Broadway Avenue. It was actually during Fashion Week. And uh, did some little feeding trials of the ants living in the medians. And here what we had was potato chips, cookies, and hot dogs, but also some crickets. And the idea here is that if they're missing something in their diet that they can't supplement with human foods, we're going to expect them to go crazy for the crickets. But if not, then it seems like they're able to balance their diet by sampling different types of human foods. So what happened? Well, here I'm going to orient you to the graph. We have the amount of time we left that food out on the x-axis, the percentage of pavement ants that went to each bait, and then this dotted line is 25%. With four baits, if they were just randomly choosing, then you would expect them to all hover around the 25% line. First, let's look at crickets. They definitely were not hovering around the 25% line. Within 25, I'm sorry, within 20 minutes, about pretty close to 100% of all the ants visiting baits were visiting the crickets. And that declined over time. If we look at these other foods, they pretty much are hovering over the 25% line. And they only really increase 
after cricket use goes down. And you might think, OK, well, they got whatever they needed from the crickets pretty quick and then shifted to the easier food. But actually, this is what it looked like. So what you can see are, are bait stations. This is after one hour. The potato chips, hot dogs, and cookies all have pavement ants on them. The crickets are just gone. They're gone. They ate them all. <laughs> and we learned we needed to check our baits more frequently. <laughs> but uh, so it does seem that, that that is something that's happening in the system. And uh, what we're excited to do is understand the colony-wide consequences of that as a next step. And with that, I'm just going to go back to those two questions. So how much do ants contribute to food removal services in cities? It looks like they're contributing a lot, but mostly in the most urban environments. In the protected areas within the city, other animals are able to perform some of those functions. And how does human food affect ant ecology? Well, we know that it's changing their food preferences and they're missing parts of the foods that they need. And that's all I have, so I'm happy to take any questions if you guys have some. So I have a question related to the particle size of food. Um, so here we've got a bunch of ants swarming something that I can't really identify now because there's so many of them on it. Um, that's but, a Cheeto. Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> well, I won't be eating in that condition anyway. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> Do you know whether or not the size of the dropped food indicates, because you know, if you drop an entire half a hamburger, you know, a rat can kind of pull that away pretty quick, whereas ants are going to have to disassemble that compared to maybe a cricket leg where a couple ants can sort of heft the thing and run off of it. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And we thought about that as we were doing these speeding trials, because early on it seemed like they were actually having a really easy time taking away cookie crumbs, but a much harder time processing a hot dog. And so that's something that we're, we're actually thinking might be important. But it was just swamped by the effect of crickets. And the crickets actually, in that study, took longer for them to deal with than anything else did, because, uh, <laughs> because it, they've got this thick exoskeleton, and it's uh, much easier to take apart Little, little pieces of hot dog than it is. And, and crackers, I'm sorry, cookies and uh, potato chips are really easy to handle yeah. for them. And uh, one really interesting thing is that they're remarkable at taking away things. And one, one little piece of evidence we had of this was my friend Jason Munchi South, who I pointed out studies rodents in New York City was thinking the same thing as what you just said. He said, rats are so big and ants are so small. There's no way ants are affecting rats feeding. They're not real competitors for rats. And I was like, I don't know. A little ant maybe, but a whole colony, that's a lot of biomass. So we were having this debate back and forth. And then he set out some traps with food in them to try to trap rats. And ants ate all that food before he could get any rats. And so he was like, um, do you want to study ants and rats and how they eat food? Because it does seem like um, just the speed of response of ants and, and the combined biomass of an entire colony seem to kind of level that playing field a little bit. So my other question is based off of some experiences that I've had with ants eating grasshoppers that I attempted to tether. Oh, tethering. Right? Uh -huh. Obviously, here we have fire ants, and they'll swarm. And this is Anything actually a picture move. of fire ants in North Carolina. Yeah, and, and rip it to little pieces, um, including some fairly large locusts. Um, do you have evidence that suggests that the rodents and the ants are in any way directly impacting each other? For instance, are there ants that are coming into you know, rat nests and stinging the babies to death and chopping them apart and pulling them away? Do you have rodents who are saying, I love my crackers once it's got lots of ants on it, you know. So we don't have any yet, but I'm actually starting a project with Jason to ask that exact question. So we're going to have an experiment excluding ants and excluding rats in a factorial design and look at both competition 
We haven't thought about predation, but that's a good one because ants do do that. Yeah. Um, competition and facilitation too, because there's some evidence from classic ecological studies in the desert, in the Sonoran and Chihuahuan deserts, that rodents actually perform better if they're around ant nests because of the aeration of the soil. And so, so we're interested to know how, how they influence each other in that way. I can tell you that in one of those feeding trials, a rat took off with all of the bait. Um, it wasn't the one I was watching, but I got a text from my colleague who was like, rats. <laughs> so they're definitely, um, there's some competition and ants don't always win. Hello, so my question relates to um, the function of carbohydrates and proteins and fats. So I'm really interested in the idea that you found that they had this preference for oil um, compared to other feeding trials where they seem to be showing is either a carb protein story. So what do you, th where do you think the oil is fitting in in that story now based on maybe what it's doing for them physiologically speaking and you know maybe thinking back to the previous feeding trials like what might be going on there. Yeah so I think that in the previous feeding trials a lot of the sources of fat were still around so there's a uh, Small insects can actually still have fat, but not a lot of good protein. Things like um, termites that you don't see a lot in these median habitats are actually great ant food, but they're a little, what's the word? They're a little cryptic. It's, it's a little harder to see that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating finding that they're really going for these fats so much because you think of human foods as being fatty. But uh, it's, it's still a mystery for us what's happening physiologically. And it's, so it's one thing I'd like to do in the future in the lab is, is feed ants this human diet. Feed them like ultra fatty diet compared to a more balanced diet and see what happens to colony condition and, um, and really see what, what might be missing from, from these city colonies. But no, it's a great question. It's just something that we don't have a good answer for yet that we're still trying to tease apart because it was a huge surprise. We were really expecting this protein versus sugar story. And uh, so most of the work that's been done has been done assuming that the important things are proteins and sugars. So that's cool. <laughs> not a satisfying answer, but that's where we are right now. And no, it's kind it's of exciting. It's, it's really exciting cool. to me. It's exciting that there are still questions. I love that also about science, that when you answer one, a whole stockpile of other questions arise. And we can do things in the lab and in the field and in the greenhouse to try to disentangle some of that complexity. So. Mm -hmm. um, what effects do our diet have on the evolution of ants I know you, and rats? You said, said that earlier, but I might have missed if you went in depth on it. So that's something that we don't have good data for yet, but we have theory for. So the idea there is that you could have a selective filter. So you could have... Um, the ants that are actually able to survive on a human diet are able to reproduce and survive in these really urban environments. But the ants that need more of that more natural diet are going to not be able to survive in those environments. And because we've isolated them in patches where they can survive, that's where we're going to see, we think, this rapid diversification or rapid speciation <laughs> happening uh, where because we're applying these selective filters and then isolating them, we're going to speed up the rate of evolution. So um, like how long do you think it will take until you see actual like, I don't know. Results? So pavement ants are the oldest recorded exotic ants in America. I think it was 1827 that they were first recorded in America. 
And uh, they don't have the kind of effects that fire ants have on their ecosystems, so they don't get as much study. But they've definitely had enough generations to start showing some of those patterns. And we have uh, another collaborator at Fordham who's running some genetic tests of different pavement ants we found in different habitats. Mm. And there are a couple of things that we're going to be able to tell from that. The first is how many actual invasions we're dealing with. Because you generally assume that when an exotic species comes in, it has you know just like this one mated queen for ants that was able to survive. So the genetic diversity is really low. But cities are these, you know, almost these microcosms. For, for different introductions. And this is a port city with lots of people and lots of movement, lots of, lots of plants being moved around which transport ants. And so there could be multiple introductions and a lot more genetic diversity than you would expect. So we'll be able to tell that. And we'll also be able to tell if we're actually getting isolated pockets of different ants in these different habitat types. And that would be evidence of cryptic diversification starting to happen. It's pretty exciting. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh -huh. um, I'm going to ask one more directed just so our students can hear that. Have you always been in love with ants, or is this something that you came to in undergrad, or when did you develop this, these questions for ants? Sure. So I was one of those kids who sat in the outfield looking at insects <laughs> instead of paying attention to the ball. So I've always been kind of what they call a bug hound. But uh, when I first was starting to decide what to do with my career, you know, I thought I had to do something big and important. And it was really intimidating. And then uh, I started taking some biology classes and getting really interested in conservation. And then I went to the tropics. I went to Costa Rica as a sophomore undergrad and I had all this interest in insects and then ants are every there. Has anyone here ever been to the tropics? Well you might see this in nature videos, YouTube, but everywhere you go there are ants and they're, they're performing all these different functions and as I learned more and more I found out these things that I've been fascinated with my entire life are actually the things that are driving a lot of patterns in the tropics, the most diverse place you know, in the world, the diverse habitat type. And so I started doing work in the tropics. And uh, actually, right before I started here, I was working in Samoa, which is in the South Pacific. It's in the heart of Polynesia. And what was really interesting about that to me, I was studying this mutualism which is, just means both species benefit, between a native plant and an invasive ant in Samoa. And uh, how it affected all of the diversity of insects in the, this tropical island ecosystem. And the really kind of fascinating thing that I came to was, even when I ran all the way out to a remote tropical island, humans were a big part of this story. Because the plants were cultivated by humans, and the ants that were uh, less problematic, that weren't invasive, avoided humans, whereas this invasive species preferred to be around humans. And so we saw all of this effect with humans. And that got me thinking about the ecology where people live and work. So then I came here and went you know, from going to these islands in the Pacific to islands on Broadway and <laughs> thinking about urban ecology and really adding people back into the ant story. But yeah, since, and my, my general rule is if I ever stop being excited and coming up with questions about ants, I'll think about studying something else. But so far I've been lucky enough that the questions I'm most excited about, my study system, my ants answer really well. Okay, um, 
You know how like uh, humans have senses through their nose? How do ants sense foods? They have a lot of sensory organs. Mostly their their uh, their antennae are their big sensory organs, and uh, they've also got little hairs on their bodies where they can sense different things. Um, but smell is much more important to ants than vision or hearing, although they can do, they can pick up on most of them. There are some blind ants that just live underground, and, uh, but most ants can pick up visual signals. They just have more sophisticated uh, smelling organs, and, and the big ones are the, the antennae. And what's the average lifespan of an ant? Depends on what kind of ant you're talking about. So most, most workers just live a few weeks, unless it, it's in the temperate zone, when some of them stick around and overwinter, and then they last a couple of months longer. But going out and foraging is, is really a, a dangerous thing, and so a lot of workers die a lot younger, but queen ants can live really long. And I'm not sure about the average for all ants, that's an interesting question, but I do know the maximum, which was about 30, 36, I think. Over 30, for sure, which was a queen ant in Japan kept in a lab. So those were ideal conditions, but 30 years is when ant lived. And those are Really, when we think about ants, we think about the colony and the life of the colony. And, and so, although individual workers may have short lives, the life of the colony can be on the scale of decades pretty, pretty commonly. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Okay, well, join me again in thanking uh, Dr. Savage for that great job. Yeah.